Last time I was preaching here, um, Shane had given me the lovely topic of heaven and hell. Um, and I, um, I didn't quite complain, but I suggested that maybe um, I'd been given this topic as some kind of payback for all the times when I've been given Bible passages that are among, among my favourites to preach on. Um, and then the other week I discovered that this week I was going to be preaching on um, uh, the rapture and uh, Jesus' second coming and uh, the last things. Um, and if there's a topic that's uh, been cause of more disagreements, more weird ideas and more conflict um, than issues around heaven and hell, it's probably um, around the area of the rapture, Jesus' second coming and the last things. Um, the, the weird ideas are just everywhere. Because it is a long and difficult chapter. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 24. And why I popped out earlier into the office um, was to go and look for the, the, the pile of Bibles that we have for, for Sunday school um, in the hopes that they weren't using them for Sunday school and I could bring them in for people who hadn't brought their Bibles. Um, but they're in the, they were in the other office and by the time I discovered that, the children were already... So if you've got your Bible, or your phone, or your tablet, or whatever, please turn to, which is pretty good going. All right, Stephen. Um, but let, let, let's look at it. Oh, no, actually, let's wait a moment while the, they give out the spare Bible. These things are made the wrong way round. They're made for, for, for women... And not for men. Um, and they're not made reversible. So, Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to be suggesting to you that a large part of this chapter is sh- overshadowed by the thought of the coming destruction of Jerusalem. Um, And you'll see as we read through the chapter how much of what Jesus says in this chapter um, is coloured by that event which was, in his day, 40 years in the future still, but is one of the the, the events that shaped the Jewish people and so shaped the early Christian people. Let's look at the first two verses. After Jesus left the temple, his disciples came over and said, Look at all these buildings! Jesus replied, Do you see these buildings? They will certainly be torn down. Not one stone will be left in place. And that's what in AD 70 happened. Um, The Romans got fed up with uh, Jewish people forever complaining and rebelling and uh, uh, engaging in a kind of guerrilla warfare. uh, And they marched in with their legions uh, and they overpowered the, the resistance and they entered Jerusalem and it's not quite true that not one stone remains on another the, the, the base of uh, that Herod had built um, for the temple that remains um, but the temple buildings themselves were completely demolished uh, just ruins so how do the disciples respond to this Later, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is just across from the temple, and you can see the temple from the Mount of Olives. So the temple is still literally in the background to what Jesus is saying. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him in private and asked, When will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Jesus answered, Don't let anyone fool you. Many will come and claim to be me, They will say they are the Messiah, and they will fool many people. You'll soon hear about wars and threats of wars, but don't be afraid. These things will have to happen first. But that isn't the end. Nations and kingdoms will go to war against each other. People will starve to death, and in some places there will be earthquakes. But this is just the beginning of the troubles. Notice what's going on here. It's quite interesting. Jesus has been talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem and in particular of the temple. And the disciples have jumped to the thought of 
the time at the end when Jesus returns and God puts everything right. And they say, when? When are you coming, Jesus? And disciples have been asking that question ever since. When? When are you coming, Jesus? Do you know what yesterday was? What day? Yeah. Guy Fawkes. Well, it was, yes, that's true. Uh, What else was yesterday? It was Saturday. Yep, that's true. We've had true, true answers. What else was yesterday? No. Mm, uh, I don't think so. Certainly not Lent, but I don't think Christmas either. (laughs) No, not All Saints Day. It was the 5th of November. 5th of November is the day when we remember, or don't, (laughs) (laughs) the the events at Parihaka in in Taranaki, where a peaceful village um, was resisting passively. They were doing nothing violent, um, but they were resisting uh, attempts to take their land. And the imperial government sent in troops, armed troops, to that peaceful village. The large proportion of the people in that village were Christians. What do you think they were saying today, uh, loads of years ago? When are you coming back, Jesus? Come back and put things right. When will it be? And that's what the disciples were doing. The world around them was falling to pieces. It was a mess. And they were saying, when, Jesus, when will you be coming back? And then Jesus says to them, there'll be lots and lots of people will come and claim to be the Messiah. Lots of them. Take no notice of them. None of them is going to be me. And he says, there'll be wars and rumors of wars and lots of trouble. There'll be earthquakes. But that's not even the beginning of me coming back. All that stuff, that's not it. Thank you, Jesus. That's very helpful. We didn't actually want to know what wasn't the sign that you were coming back. We wanted to know what was. When are you coming back, Jesus? Please, when? Come back. Jesus goes on. It gets more personal. You will be arrested, punished, and even killed. Because of me, you will be hated by people of all nations. Many will give up and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will come and fool lots of people. Evil will spread and cause many on being faithful right to the end. You will be saved. When the good news about the kingdom has been preached all over the world and told to all nations, the end will come. So, on top of all the terrible things that are going to happen to the world, all sorts of bad stuff will happen to you. But, even that isn't the end. The end can't come until the good news has been preached everywhere. So, wait a bit. You've got some work to do before I can come back. Until the good news has been preached everywhere, I can't come back. And you'll have to go on putting up with these wars and rumors of wars, with these earthquakes, with this persecution, with all the terrible stuff that goes on in a world in a mess. Because the world will not stop being a mess until the gospel has been preached everywhere. And then the way will be clear. Verse 15. Someday you will see that horrible thing in the holy place, just as the prophet Daniel said. Um, the, the more traditional translation of that is the abomination of desolation. And in Daniel, it almost certainly refers to the time when the uh, Greek emperor, who, who was ruling that part of the world, uh, decided it would be a good idea to have a lovely statue of himself put into the temple in Jerusalem so that everybody could properly worship him. Um, and the Jewish people, who knew that there was only one God, um, quite sensibly, didn't like that idea, and it, it started a big fight. Um, 
But presumably Jesus isn't talking about that. Um, one of the things that uh, will, in 40 years or so's time, start the big fight with the Romans that ended up in the destruction of Jerusalem was an attempt to put Roman symbols of power into the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus may be referring to that. Someday, you will see that horrible thing in the holy place, just as the prophet Daniel said. Everyone who reads this must try to understand. If you're living in Judea at that time, run for the mountains. If you're on the roof of your house, don't go inside to get anything. If you're out in the field, don't go back for your coat. It will be a terrible time for women who are expecting babies or nursing young children. That is a description of the coming of the Roman legions to destroy um, everything in, in, in that part of the world. If you're in Jerusalem, the place to go is to the hills. Um, the, 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 the almost desert that surrounds Jerusalem and is the place where um, refugees and uh, outlaws and the rest have always gone to hide, where David went to hide. It will be, uh, sorry, uh, verse 20. And pray that you won't have to escape in winter or on a Sabbath. This will be the worst time of suffering since the beginning of the world. Nothing this terrible will ever happen again. If God doesn't make the time shorter, no one will be left alive. But because of God's, God's chosen ones, he will make the time shorter. Someone may say, here's the Messiah. Or... So there, there are going to be people clapping. Sorry, I'll try putting it the other way around and see if that. Tell me if it makes too many scratching noises. Um, there are going to be people who will say, the end is now. And some of them will say, and I'm the Messiah, come back. Take no notice whatsoever. It's not true. Now, this sounds a bit odd to me, having only read this far through the chapter. Because, presumably, if we applied that advice every time, when Jesus does come back, we would say of Jesus, it's not him. So, there's something interesting going on there. And when there's interesting things going on in the Bible, it's always worth reading a bit more to see if, you, if reading a bit more helps you to get it. So, let's read a bit more. Verse 27. Uh, where are we? 27. The coming of the Son of Man will be like lightning that can be seen from east to west. You see, when Jesus does come back, it won't be a question of is it him or isn't it. This is, will be something that everyone will know from east to west. Now, it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that lightning can be seen from east to west because lightning can actually only be seen um, uh, not quite as far as you can see across the Earth's surface, but um, not much further than that. Um, because it happens in the sky, it can be seen a little bit further. Um, and so, probably, lightning can't be seen even all over New Zealand, let alone all over the Earth. But if you want a picture... And so much of the Bible is picture language. If you want a picture for an event which can be seen everywhere, lightning is a pretty good picture to use. Because lightning can be seen by everyone who's within sight of it. So when Jesus does come back, it won't be a question of somebody saying, hey, he's over here, come with me. We'll know. It will be obvious, like like a sheet of lightning, to everyone who's looking. Like it or not, we'll know. And that's why Jesus can say, all of these people who say, hey, he's back, are wrong. Because when he does come, it's anyone to say it. Everyone will know it. And then there's that odd verse, where there is a corpse, there will always be buzzards. What's going on there? Well, for a start, it reads like a proverb, doesn't it? I mean, look at it. It's got the air of being a proverb. It's not an English proverb. 
But it's a proverb that makes sense, uh, at least if you understand buzzards to be... And other translations will have other kinds of birds there. I think this one's an American translation. Um, Where there's a corpse, there'll always be vultures, is the way I would have translated it. Um, And it it sounds like a proverb. So Jesus is quoting a proverb, and the proverb is saying, where there's a corpse, there'll be birds of scavenger birds coming. What's that all about? Well, I think that's all about all these people who will be saying, here he is, he's over here, come with us. Um, who are <coughs> treating our world as if it's a corpse and they're birds of, uh, scavenger birds. Because everybody is going to want this return of Jesus to, to happen, people will play on that and use it. But they're, 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 they're not up, up to any good. They're like scavenger birds. They're like vultures. If you go to the next slide, please, Stephen. Moving on, because we've got 51 verses, so we're only about halfway. Verse 29. Right after those days of suffering, and then in this Bible, the next little bit is printed indented. That's because um, what Jesus is doing is, is quoting the prophets. And it seems to be a mixture of bits from, mainly verses from Isaiah. Um, the sun will become dark and the moon will no longer shine and the stars will fall and the powers in the sky will be shaken. Now that's pretty dramatic. And what Jesus is quoting is, is passages from Isaiah and from Joel that are describing uh, terrible events which will happen in the future and which will, everyone will see. Um, these are not things which happen in a corner. These are things which everyone will know about. And as a result, they're described as happening in the sky. Because what happens in the sky, everyone knows about. Then, verse 30, A sign will appear in the sky, and there will be the Son of Man. All nations on earth will weep when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now again, this has to be picture language. Because physically, uh, there is nowhere, um, no direction from which Jesus can come where every nation on earth will be able to see him. Think about it. There just isn't. No matter how high you go, um, there are some parts of the sky that that you can't see from some parts of the earth. Um, New Zealand and... uh, the, the coast of Spain, the, the, the Atlantic coast of Spain, cannot see the, the some parts of the sky that the earth blocks people in. Um, so it's picture language. And again it's saying, when Jesus comes back, everyone will see and know. This won't be something that you'll have to ask questions about. Is he here or not? Everyone will know he's come. Because everything will change. Verse 32. No, no, sorry. uh, uh, Verse uh, 31. Um, At the sound of a loud trumpet, he will send his angels to bring his chosen ones together all over the earth. So, not only will everyone know that Jesus has come, but all of Jesus' chosen ones, all those who are in him, will be gathered together. Now, verse 32. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches sprout and start putting out leaves, you know that summer is near, which is great news because our fig tree has started to get leaves. Um, In the last few weeks, you might think from the weather that summer is near. So, when you see all these things happening, all this stuff I've been talking about, you will know that the time is almost come. You see... Wars, trouble, earthquakes and the rest of it, persecution, all of that, that's not the end. But it's a sign that hopefully the end is near. I can promise you that some of the people of this generation will still be alive when all this happens. Now there's a verse that poses problems 
and we scratch our heads over. Alan's obviously been scratching head, his head over it quite a bit. It's a really puzzling verse because there is no one still alive today who was alive in Jesus' time. There's not some ancient Jewish person hidden in a cave somewhere, I, I, I promise you, um, who was alive in Jesus' time. So what's Jesus on about? When Jesus returns, everything will change. All that is wrong will be put right. I I think what he's saying is that that happens not only to the whole earth, but it happens to each person. There there are lots of things like that. Things that will happen to everyone, but that also happen to each person. And I think Jesus is saying that each of you will, will, will experience this end. Some of you will experience it in the natural course of events uh, when you die, and some of you will experience it because you are alive at the end. I can't see any, any other way that makes sense. The sky and the earth won't last forever. But my words will. Promise just like the ones in lots of parts of the Bible. Verse 36. No one knows the day or the hour. The angels in heaven don't know. The Son himself doesn't know. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man appears, things will be just as they were when Noah lived. People were eating, drinking and getting married right up to the day when the flood came. And Noah went into the big boat. They didn't know anything was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. That's how it will be when the Son of Man appears. Two men will be in the same field, but only one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be together grinding the grain, but only one will be taken, the other will be left. So be on your guard. You don't know when the Lord will come. Homeowners never know when a thief is coming. And they're always on guard to keep one from breaking in. Always be ready. You don't know when the Son of Man will come. This is where I I get to the business about some verses in this chapter being difficult and complicated and puzzling. Because that's the problem. The problem comes when we take verses. We lift little bits of the Bible out. And when we do that, and we lift little bits of the Bible out on their own, often they're difficult. And we scratch our heads and we end up like Alan or me. But when we read them in the context of the whole flow of the passage, they make much better sense. So here, the bits that are difficult make much better sense when we read them in the context of the flow of this passage because there it's quite clear what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, my coming back is going to be like a thief. No one who owns a house knows when the thieves are going to break in. You don't. I mean, if you knew, things would be very different, wouldn't they? You'd call the police in advance. 999, excuse me, um, uh, there's people going to break into my house on Tuesday at 4 in the morning. Could you possibly come round uh, at about 3 to be there before them? I mean, it's not like that. When thieves come, you don't know when they're coming. And that's why you put fancy locks on your doors and you maybe have an alarm to set and all all that stuff because you want to be ready when the thief does come and and that's what Jesus is saying his return is going to be like that it's going to be something when you don't know when it's going to happen which is my response whenever one of these guys gets it into his head to say Jesus is coming back on October the 16th (laughs) next year or whatever Well, the one thing we can be absolutely sure about is that it won't be that day. Um, Because Jesus says no one knows. Um, But the point of what he's saying is not um, about the fact that no one knows. It's, it's, It's that because we don't know, we should be ready. Just like you make your house as ready as you can for burglars coming. So we should make our lives as ready as we can for Jesus coming. We shall make our world as ready as we can for Jesus' coming. 
Uh, where are we up to? Ugh. Ah, yes. About to turn the page in my Bible. Verse 45. And this is the end of the chapter, but not quite the end of the sermon. Who are faithful and wise servants? Or to put it another way, what kind of servants are the faithful and wise ones? Who are the ones the master will put in charge of of giving the other servants their food and supplies at the proper time? Good question. Remember, this is a a society where servants actually mean slaves. um, And wealthy or even well-to-do households, or even actually if they were Roman, poor households had slaves to do the work. We have dishwashers uh, and the like. They had slaves. Um, And one of the things you had to do if you were running a house was to pick which slaves you would leave in charge when you weren't there. Because you couldn't be there all the time. And so when you weren't there, which slaves are going to be in charge and run things in your absence? And of course it made a a lot of difference whether you made a good choice or a bad choice. If you made a bad choice, things would become a mess while you're gone. If you made a good choice, the household would still be running well when you returned. Verse 46. Servants are fortunate if their master comes and find them doing their job. They may be sure, you may be sure that a servant who is always faithful will be put in charge of everything the master owns. But suppose one of the servants thinks that the master won't return until late. You get the picture. This lucky servant's been put in charge. And he becomes convinced that the master isn't coming back until late tonight. So what does he do? What do you think he does? Or have you read it ahead in your Bible and you know? What do you think he does? Yeah, sits back in a chair and has a party. Or at least gets the other servants to... Well, let's see what Jesus says. Um... Suppose that evil servant starts beating the other servants and eats and drinks with people who are drunk. If that happens, the master will surely come on a day and a time when the servant least expects him. So picture it. There's the servant, he's been put in charge, and he's been doing whatever he felt like, uh, not doing his job, and suddenly, when he doesn't expect it, the master returns. don't want to be that servant, do you? You can imagine how cross the master is going to be. And actually, in the Roman Empire, uh, if you were the master and you had that servant, you would be quite justified in quite literally crucifying them. Um, There were masters who did. Uh, The kinder ones put them to death more gently um, or sold them into some kind of slavery that was even less um, pleasant than being a house slave. If that happens, the master will surely come on a day and a time when the servant least expects him. That servant will then be punished and thrown out with the ones who only pretended to serve their master. There they will cry and grit their teeth in pain. And that's how the chapter ends. It's not quite how Jesus finishes talking about this subject, because he goes on to tell the parable of the the, the ten girls at the wedding, uh, and five of them had uh, the oil for their lamps and five didn't which is basically saying the same thing over again, with a different picture, a rather nicer picture. But let's stop at the end of the chapter. What's Jesus' point in this chapter? What was the one thing that Jesus wants us to get, if we don't get anything else from this chapter, what's the one thing that Jesus wants us to get from it? Be ready, yeah. Don't be the bad slave. Um, Be ready. Expect the master to return any time. Because the one thing you can be sure of is he'll return when you don't expect it. So be ready. Yeah. That's what Jesus is teaching in this chapter. That's the thing where if we don't get it, Jesus will say, oh dear. And I tried so hard. That's the thing that we must get from this chapter. Because it's the thing that Jesus really wants us to learn from it. Other stuff is less important. Some of it's true, some of it isn't, but it's less important. That is vital. It's vital because that's the bit that affects our eternal destiny. 
go to the next slide, please. So, all this business of the rapture, when will Jesus return, what's going to happen, will there be a thousand years of what, and will it be before this or after that, all those questions, Christians fight over them, Christians divide from each other over them, Christians erect walls over them, none of them is vital. They are not the important bits. We're being sidetracked if we get into all that. We're like the people Jesus was talking about who are saying, hey, the Messiah's over here, come with me, he's hidden in a cave. Um, We've got it wrong. Not only that, but the really important things in the Bible are not said once or twice, they're said again and again. And that message that usually aren't, There's a clue. The details are are not important. The central core truth is... Next one, please. Uh, I've talked about that stuff. Go to the next one, please, Stephen. Sorry, I... We also need, though, to remember that when Jesus returns, uh, he returns with two roles. He comes as saviour and as judge. He comes as judge and as saviour. And if we don't meet him as the one, we meet him as the other. Jesus comes to put everything right. But the only way you can put everything right is by getting rid of what's wrong. And so it's vital to us that we are in the right place, not not physically, but but, uh, spiritually and mentally, when Jesus returns, so that we meet him as saviour and not as judge. So, all of that other stuff, including the idea of the rapture, with capital letters, which I haven't, yes I have, um, used there, um, that's all secondary. None of it is really important. What is vital is that we are expecting and hoping that Jesus will return and put things right. Like so many Christian people have been doing across the ages. Prepared. That we are not the slave who is sitting back and enjoying themselves uh, at everyone else's expense. Um when Jesus returns. Because when Jesus returns, he comes as both judge and saviour. Next one, please, Stephen. So, there's lots in this passage that's puzzling. There are lots of verses in there that were really puzzling. We we paused at one or two of them, but by no means all of the difficult ones. Um, If you look through the chapter when you get home, you'll be able to pick out lots more verses that are really difficult, really puzzling, um, and, but look at them in the context of the whole chapter and, you, and you'll find that the puzzle by and large goes away not completely some of them we can scratch our heads over and some of them we can mark off in our Bibles as uh, I'm going to ask Jesus about that when I see him um, but through all that the point that Jesus was making was quite clear There wasn't anybody who came up with somehow this size. So what was the point of that? And they'll come up with at least six different answers. Not this chapter. This chapter, everyone comes up with the same answer. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when it will be. Be ready. That's the message we're to get from this chapter. Go to the next one. It strikes me it's it's a bit like um, that experience that so many bereaved people have, um, particularly where the death has been sudden. And the the person who's left says, oh, I wish the last thing we'd said had not been. Last things that we say are really important. But if you believe in the resurrection, they are not as important as 
first impressions. What will Jesus see when he returns? In you. In me. Because his return is going to be unexpected, sudden. We won't have a week to get ready. We won't have a day to get ready. Are we living the kind of lives that we want Jesus to see? That we want Jesus to to, to say, yeah, you've been a good servant. You are a good servant. Come, join me in that uh, mansion I've been getting ready. Or will Jesus say, you're part of the problem. You're part of what is making this world such a mess. Will Jesus find someone who